there's a a very childlike and genius simplicity to this setup <laughs> that you don't have to worry about constantly altering mic distance. Yeah. It's pretty smart. Sex positive culture. It's my body to give. Are threesome gifts a thing? Taking a bra off. I like your bed. Horizontal. 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 This is Horizontal with Lila. I'm Lila, and I am horizontal in Los Angeles, California. And I'm Rai, and I'm horizontal with Lila. Horizontal is a podcast about intimacy of all kinds. It's recorded while lying down, wearing robes, sharing a single pillow. I take you into my bed, or in the case of these episodes, recorded while I was on the road across America, somebody else's bed, and let your ears watch as I unzip intimate conversations. My goal is to make private conversations public in order to dispel shame, diminish loneliness, and alchemize connection. In this installment, I lie down with Rye of Rye Polytalks, a non-monogamy consultant, a clear talking, thoughtful advocate for alternative relationships and kinky stuff, an entertainer, a dominant, a consent activist, public speaker, social justice warrior, and the host of many, many a panel. Rye Poly talks are panel discussions with relationship experts that he moderates on a web of topics related to non-monogamy. I got to see his showmanship in action when he hosted the Ethical Slut Social at Hacienda Studio, twice and led two such panels in our event space. His ringmasterishness sure can command a room. He's also passionately involved in the movement to destigmatize the conversation around mental health. As the daughter of a woman diagnosed with bipolar disorder, who has been fighting for her health nearly all of my life, and as a person who experiences depression along with or possibly caused by undiagnosed seasonal affective disorder, this advocacy is very dear to me. Rye's voice sounds like whiskey and a rec room with burgundy leather armchairs. I like it. In this part of our conversation, we talk about playing 90210, internalized slut shaming, relationship anarchy, sperm control, also known as a vasectomy, prep, and how herpes is really not that big of a deal. My dear listeners, I want to let you know about a change that's coming up. I have big, big dreams, like making a pilot for a horizontal TV show, and I realize that I need much more freedom to be able to achieve them, and that means finances. I'm deeply committed to making this my career, and I'm still holding to my intention to bring you independent, uncensored, and ad-free radio. The podcast doesn't yet break even. Patreon covers less than half of the monthly production expenses, and it's time for my project to grow up. I need to experiment with different models of income. So going forward, the second part of my conversation with each guest will be gated, meaning roughly every other episode will be free and every other episode will be paid. All episodes will always be available to patrons at a certain level and up, and they'll be available for purchase individually as well. So, if you enjoy lying down with us and believe in my mission to spread intimacy across the globe, this is how you can make sure I continue to create independent, uncensored, ad-free radio. Become a patron of the Horizontal Arts. It's a cross between a subscription service and crowdfunding for artistic patronage. You offer a monthly contribution from $2 a month on up, and you get a level of special access to me and my work. Since in the next few weeks, every other episode will be free and every other episode will cost a small amount, patronage will be the way to unlock all of the gated episodes. And I just want to make one thing super clear. 
Many friends have told me that they've been hesitant to become my patrons because they feel embarrassed to only be able to give $2 a month. Oh my goodness. If everybody who loves the podcast or my writing became a patron at $2 a month, it would change my life. Every patron is so incredibly valuable to me. And the beauty of crowdfunding is exactly this, that when many people give a little bit, it can add up to something really meaningful, to something that supports me to fulfill my purpose. Patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila. It's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You can also follow the link in my Instagram bio that reads patron of the horizontal arts. Thank you for supporting my mission. Thank you for supporting me as I change and as I grow. And now, come lie down with us in L.A. Rice Place is sort of like a horror boudoir. And he's got a lot of red, red curtains and red fabrics and red pillowcases. Robe is red. With little hearts. With little hearts? Yeah, it's Aww. covered in hearts. That's cute. Blue hearts. Black hearts. Pink hearts with stars in them. White hearts. That's cute. I see a lot of books and a few things with fangs. The fang creature over there is a teddy bear, and its entire body is mouth. <laughs> And you can wear it as a face mask. Whoa. It's custom made from a horror convention in St. Louis. Whoa. Were you interested in horror things as a child? Kind of. Mostly, I guess, horror-styled music. Like White Zombie and Rob Zombie and Slayer. Scary music was, was pretty cool. Especially when I was going to Christian youth groups. Ooh. I was the little Catholic boy with a Slayer t-shirt. Okay. So what did you learn as a Catholic boy about sex growing up? That it was very bad. Everything about it was bad. Unless you were married. And then it was good. Masturbation was a great sin worse than cheating. Worse than cheating? Uh, that's what I was told. Jeez. <laughs> it seems egregious. And you confessed. Yeah. Pretty regularly. And then I'd feel a lot better. I still refer to a lot of emotional processing as confession with penance and absolution. I almost became a priest. So it's uh, very much ingrained into me. My dad, too. When you say almost, how almost? He had gone to seminary, completed all his studies, and then decided not to be ordained. He got a lot farther than I did. I, uh, I was 18, and the decision between university or seminary was pretty difficult. But university won. And sex was the main reason it won. At that point... Had you had any? It depends on what the definition of is, is. Yes. You know, oral and hand jobs and that kind of thing. Not much of it, though. What was your first experience? With what? A lot of experiences. Mm, yeah, yeah. So what's your first memory of engaging with another human being? sexually six years old me and my best friend would ride our bikes across the neighborhood to meet up with two little sisters they were five and six years old and then we would all get shirtless and play 90210 which meant making out with each other and then swapping and making out with each other <laughs> And then she stuck her tongue in my mouth, and that was really weird and gross. And she says, well, that's how they do it on 90210. So I said, okay, and we continued. 
was the sensation just wrong, just slimy? and I didn't understand why she did it. I literally just said, why did you do that? I still don't understand in a way. No. <laughs> it it takes so I I like really dry sensual kisses until you're super aroused and then you know pretty much anything goes. But when people come at me with a tongue or just just bleh, <laughs> I'm not it's such a turn off for me. And also really wet. I had a partner who for a while would lick their lips before every time they kissed me and I was like please don't do that <laughs> why 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 are you doing that and they thought it would be nicer for me <laughs> they didn't want to kiss me with dry lips and I was like oh no no please that that would be great I would enjoy that <laughs> Did, were there costumes involved costumes yeah in, in playing 90210 no part of it was an inside joke among all of us because the babysitter would be distracted watching 90210 while we were playing 90210 <laughs> and had any of you actually sat down and watched it with the babysitter yeah we weren't supposed to but we would sometimes and was there any role play or is this getting just too no, it wasn't that sophisticated. It okay. was just an elaborate excuse to kiss each other and you know lay on top of each other shirtless in their little beds. <laughs> Did you have a sense that that was something that you shouldn't talk about, that you shouldn't be doing and shouldn't tell? I cried about it for years, full of guilt. I thought it was a great sin and that I was going to go to hell for it. Till I was about maybe nine years old. What happened at nine? I just realized it wasn't so bad that God would probably forgive me. Probably when I did other sins, whether it was a lie or stole a cookie or something. I was oh, that that's not so bad. I confessed it. God will forgive me. Hmm. When you thought at nine that God would probably forgive you, that was a a shift in your image of what a higher power would would do, right? How how, how the response would be to your sexuality. I think I just realized how much worse everyone else was. It was always in relation to others, not so much how good or bad I've been. It was more like, I'm not so bad compared to everyone else. A bit of a, the sin of everyone is the sin of no one. Hmm. How'd you know about the others? Well, certainly a lot of exposure from TV, but also just witnessing public displays of affection. Were your parents affectionate with each other? Sometimes, mostly fighting. Did they stay together? Yeah, up until recently. Was it religion that kept them? I think that was a big factor. I think also a certain sense of integrity that they said it was going to be forever. So they wanted to try to make that happen. Mm -hmm. There's something really dark about forever. Literally death. That's the breakup point. That's when you're no longer together is when one of you dies. Right. And how can that be the arbiter of what is a good relationship? Right. That it ends in death. Then you really did it. You made it to death. There's the finish line. Here's your reward. <laughs> now you're lonely. Oh, yeah. I've used that idea as a way to sort of carpe diem myself, <laughs> remind myself that everything ends, every relationship ends, 
whether it ends in one person's death or it ends some other way still ends right so why not make it something that is nourishing and when it's no longer nourishing release that's one of the concepts i like about poly transition yeah, sometimes you do have to break up and never speak to each other again but other times you just need to change the expectations and change the way that you interact and a new relationship is born or a, a variation on it and you still have that sense of family and closeness and caring and love maybe a different type of love than the romance and lust that were there before mm. So when does sexuality become a positive part of Rai's life? Probably last week. <laughs> That's hard to put a pinpoint on it because I think up until even recent years, there was a lot of internalized slut shaming. And a lot of leftover programming to deprogram. How does that even happen? Overcompensation helps. <laughs> 2009 was a wild year. That really was swinging the pendulum in the other direction. Just libertine saturation. That's the word I've decided I'm going to use <laughs> instead of slut. I don't like slut. So I'm going to use libertine. It's a good one. <laughs> I can't help but think of Marquis de Sade when I hear that word. Yeah, that was a libertine year. I still dabble in it. I really value lasting relationships and I really value sexual adventures. I haven't grown out of it by any means. But the frequency is... Not quite as pervasive. When you talk about deprogramming, and you said overcompensation helps, is it almost a cognitive behavioral therapy kind of way where you, you do the act until you no longer feel <laughs> bad about it? It well, definitely worked with masturbation. Mm-hmm. Now, being raised in an environment that really discouraged masturbation for a great variety of reasons. It was a silly waste of time. It was a sin. It was stupid. It was bad for you. And then really holding off. I don't think I fully masturbated with the conscious intent of orgasm until I was 16 even though I really wanted to at 12. And between 16 and 20, there was a hell of a lot of masturbation. And something that felt that good and had zero consequences was too powerful to ignore. And the old programming just faded away quickly. Mm. So you did it and you saw, ah, nothing, no house fell on me. And did it again, and you're like, oh, nothing bad happened again. And did it again, and did it again, and did it again, and did it again, and you're still okay. Yeah, all the good experiences really cleaned out the cobwebs. Hmm. I feel like a lot of sexuality is some form of courage overcoming fear, including emotional fears of intimacy and then you have those intimate moments over and over again and you realize this is pretty awesome i don't know what i was afraid of oh interesting i feel like emotionally i'm not afraid of heartbreak because i've experienced it many times and i'll be able to carry it And it's worth it. Better to have loved and lost. 
the experience. What are we here for if not? I'm, nobody really knows, but if it's if it's not to experience, if it's to hold ourselves back from experience, that doesn't make any sense to me. I don't think existence makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but we give things reason. I don't believe things happen for a reason. I believe that we assign reason to things. And so much of life is creation and destruction and nihilism and pointlessness. And I think the intimacy and love and connection creates the meaning to live. What's your first memory of feeling romantic love? Hmm. In high school, I had a best friend who had a huge crush on me. And I was pretty resistant for a few years. And things changed as we both grew up. And we started to date. And I remember when we had to make the hard decision in my senior year, she was in college at that point. I knew I was going to be moving away from Florida here to Los Angeles for college. And that moment when we decided to move forward with the relationship emotionally, even though we knew it would end or at least experience a major change, that felt very loving. That felt very romantic. Hmm. and dramatic and cinematic. We're going to do this anyway. Yeah. There was a fatalism to it. Like, we have to do this. We can't not do this. We can't pretend that we don't feel these things. Can't go backwards at this point. Have to go forward. There's a nice... Zach Braff indie movie in that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Run faster towards the cliffside. <laughs> hmm. I think there's something lovely about choosing heartbreak. And if there's no chance of heartbreak, are you really in love? But doesn't it always end that way, <laughs> in one way or another? Or death. Well, that is, wouldn't that be a heartbreak if your partner dies before you? Yeah, I suppose. You do hear those long romantic stories of how the love never ends. You just miss the person. And I think that happens sometimes with breakups. You just miss each other. Hmm. There's also all of those tales of the the older couple who literally can't live without the other one and, and one passes and the other passes months later. Right. Yeah. The will to live just fades without the other. Do you know any older couples who are still together? They've passed away, the ones that I knew. When you witnessed them, did you have, did you covet that? No, because they yelled at each other a lot. Oh. They were happy. They just liked yelling. <laughs> and I'd ask them as a kid, why are you yelling at each other? And they'd say, that's just how we talk. <laughs> Yeah. It was like just letting off the steam. But the love they had for each other was so cute. You know, it was so pure. But without real fights, they'd have fake ones. <laughs> it would be over silly stuff like, you cook too much spaghetti. And then yelling about that. That, that sounds like the Italian-American side of my family as well. It's like, 
I just remember my my grandma before she died and my father you know having this and it was a it was a perfectly fine conversation they weren't mad right but it was just like where's the thing it's in the car okay you know <laughs> where's the bread <laughs> we took our grandfather to the chinese restaurant for the first time in his life in his <gasps> 80s what he was so angry <laughs> where's the bread where's the pasta <laughs> Grandpa, there's plenty of pasta on the table. That's not pasta. Where's the sauce? <laughs> oh, man. Buffalo, New York. You know, World War II veteran, former coal miner, I believe, at one point. Maybe that was his father. He mixed all the Italians up. And these were your grandparents? This, this, uh, bickery this lovingly bickery couple there that was one of them yeah italian and polish i knew a handful of these older couples that loved to bicker i suppose it rubbed off on me <laughs> would your partner say that now they would say that i blame them for everything like, where's my toothbrush? What'd you do with it? <laughs> and then they say, my fault. Obviously, I didn't touch a toothbrush. Oh, no, you moved it. And then I find a toothbrush because I left it somewhere. And I go, see, I knew you moved it. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is you're a pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. <laughs> so when does polyamory come into the equation? I think when I moved from Florida to L.A., that's when I became more aware of the reality of having strong feelings for multiple people. I didn't start using the term polyamory as a self-description until I think 2010. But that tale earlier about me being six years old with my best friend and the two sisters was quite Polly. So it was always in there. Mm -hmm. The swapping was just, just the way that it went. One of us would just yell switch. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it really depends on how strict you want to be with what the definition of polyamory is. Well, give us yours. Uh, hmm. Well, I see it as a particular subculture under a bigger umbrella of non-monogamy. Mm -hmm. And there are a variety of other subcultures, and it only makes sense in contrast to the others. So you can reduce it down to prefix and suffix of many loves, but that's just confusing the matter because now you have to define love. That's really difficult. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather contrast it with things like relationship anarchy or swingers or monogamish, being that they're all some type of non-monogamy. And I see polyamory as multiple committed relationships but let's let's go there. What what's love to you? What is love? If you're having multiple loving relationships. Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> multiple no loves. Yeah, I I'm pretty strict about how I use the word love unlike most of my community and friends. I don't tell my friends I love them. It makes me uncomfortable when they say it to me. Mm. I reserve it quite strictly for my long-term, committed, serious relationships. And it's a big deal if I say I love you to a partner. And some partners I, I had for years and never said it. Sometimes they'd said it to me and I felt uncomfortable. 
because it was too big for how I felt. So I'm very reserved. Once I cross that threshold, though, it falls out of my mouth all the time. Do you also say I love you to your family? Yes. Yeah, that there's a different childhood connotation to it. A certain casualness to it, which is how I think a lot of my community uses it regarding their friends, chosen family and all that. It seems that you you take it quite seriously, and I wonder if you reserve it for people who you consider family in a way, your partners. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Unfortunately, it's not that, because there's a lot of folks that I consider family including former partners that I don't say I love you to anymore. There's a certain romantic, lustful seriousness to it. Much more akin to how most people say, I'm in love with you. Mm -hmm. But I'm hearing people use that too. I'm in love with my friend. I'm in love with pancakes. <laughs> I'm in love with my puppies. I'm in love with this romper. I'm in love with this podcast. <laughs> yes, please be in love with this podcast. <laughs> no, right. The, and it sounds like that strikes you as careless or frivolous or throwing <sighs> it around. I try not to judge how other people use it and just focus on how I use these words and what they mean to me and trying to manage expectations when people say things to me and I don't feel comfortable returning it. You know, if, if my friends want to give me a hug and tell, tell me that they love me, I don't necessarily want to scold them for it or stop them or make them feel uncomfortable for expressing themselves. I just hope that they're very comfortable with me just smiling in return with a hug, and that's it. Because hmm. I really don't know what to say back. And I, I remember going through this period exploring definitions of love across the world and across time, and reading books on things like the invention of courtly love in the 11th and 12th century. What was that like? It was maddening. This idea of the knight and the princess who never physically touch, but they love each other. And then the knight would have his mating and breeding partner that was almost like chattel. And they were having physical relationships that didn't touch the lofty divine love that the knight and princess would have it was so bizarre to me it's really a form of polyamory in itself and then somehow western culture combined those two things and of course this is one book's perception of it i believe it was called we the invention of romance i think that's the title i probably got it wrong is years ago. I'll look it up. But it always weirded me out. And, and then seeing the different definitions of Latin words for love, like eros. Right. So I wanted to see which ones you could remember. So eros is the, is the lustful love, right? Yeah, I remember that one. And then... Filial love. I believe there's six of them. Friendship, love, romantic love, sexual love. Is there an intellectual love? Hmm. Some kind of admiration? 
Hmm. Hmm. I think I experience sometimes like an intellectual lust where it's about someone's abilities, cognitive talents or, or artistic talents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel an element of lust is just not for their body. Like, right. like for the late Alan Rickman. Mm. Mm. So tell me, you moved to Los Angeles to do what? The excuse was to go to college and focus on composing for film, especially electronic music for film. Really inspired by the Dust Brothers making the Fight Club soundtrack. And Spawn had a similar electronic rock soundtrack. But the real reason was to be a rock star. Hmm. I had been playing in bands since I was 12. And I really believed that the way to make it was to move to L.A. and get an internship at a record label and meet the right executive and pass my demo. And that was going to be the key. Didn't work out. Mm-hmm. It almost did at one point, 2007, 2008, 2008, got pretty close. Just too rebellious, too anarchist about it all. And that missed the boat. There was a window of opportunity and we missed it. Hmm. I listened to you speaking about descriptive and prescriptive relationship structures right today and this concept of relationship anarchy i haven't heard anyone proclaim themselves a relationship anarchist no no i know a ton of them and i wonder if it's because the people i know who reject all labels are the <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to take the label of relationship anarchist either. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, the labelist movement is really caught on. You know, and and they take it to its extreme where you know, what is your gender? I don't have one, no label. You know, um I'm even now hearing uh refusing age as a label. Well, how old are you? I don't have an age. That used to hmm. be used as some kind of absurdum argument to deny these concepts, but now it's really being embraced, that everything is just a label and that we don't need it. I don't buy into it, though. It's not, not what I follow for ideology. In terms of gender, I've been having a lot of conversations about that, and it does seem mostly useless. <laughs> <laughs> mostly just um, an unfortunate and somewhat arbitrary division. I find that given that yesterday I was the facilitator for a men and male identified subgroup it was a discussion group of a thousand folks. And then once a month, we have a meeting of men and male identified people. There's a meeting for women and female identified. There's a meeting for non-binary folks. And those smaller subgroups, the conversation is entirely different. For one, because they're smaller, but two, because it's a dedicated focus. And I see a real value in labels and I hold my labels dearly. And I feel like it can help you find kindred spirits that have similar experiences. Otherwise, the only label we all share is human. And some people don't want that one either. Hmm. I haven't heard anybody reject that one. Interesting. Which ones do you hold dear? Well, I accept a lot of them in the sense that 
I'm cisgender, for lack of a better term, heterosexual, male, whatever you would want to describe me as. You know, if you saw me as far as how I pass, then I'm ready to embrace that, including when it excludes me from certain spaces. There's a growing movement of spaces that are exclusionary intentionally for the greater good spaces where I might not be welcome because my presence might be triggering for some folks. And I know that I have some of the trappings of my labels. Some of the worst aspects of patriarchy are pretty dominant in me. I speak authoritatively, often too authoritative on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I'm a, a trained public speaker, so I tend to be loud in a group setting because I know that'll be heard and people will pay attention to it. There's a lot of aspects of it where I feel that it's not fair for me to reject my labels. All right, but these are labels that you said you accept, and I hear that, but what I was excited about was you said there are labels that you hold dear. Yeah, uh, dominant, polyamorous, social justice warrior. I'm excited about those. Those are pretty awesome to me. <laughs> Kinky. Ooh, what's your definition of kinky? Oh, no, not this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I've been a co-host of Kinky Salon in L.A. for the last two and a half years. And it's interesting how broad the definition is. Because I've also been in the fetish scene, in the BDSM scene, since I was 18. So, 2002. And... Those two definitions are pretty different. So it's like on one side, kinky means fetish and BDSM. And on the other side, kinky means anything that's not boring, anything that's not vanilla and normal and mainstream and commonplace, which that keeps shrinking, honestly, mm -hmm. as as the mainstream gets naughtier. You know, there's that joke of. Hair pulling and ass spanking, that sounds pretty vanilla to me. <laughs> right. We are no longer our parents' kinky. It's got to be kinkier. Kink shift. I like, for myself, I like woman. And kinky. Performer, creative, lover, connector. Those are all ones I embrace. I think the first one I really embraced was entertainer. Hmm, that makes a lot of sense. You have a ringmaster-ish quality to you that I note. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely played a ringmaster in elementary school with a, a yarn whip and some other kids playing a lion. Whoa. <laughs> I tried to be a magician at one point when I was 10 and my extended family never let me forget it and always bought me more gimmick novelty magic tricks. It was only an obsession for like one summer. <laughs> That's what they remembered. Yeah. Entertaining has always been a high priority for me. I'd much rather be an entertainer than just about anything else. 
How do you drop the desire to entertain when you're in an intimate interaction with someone? I'm not sure I do drop it. I definitely want to be of interest and capture someone's attention and imagination. I just was struck by a memory that I haven't thought about in a very long time. Mm. When I was in high school, there was a big musical in town. And I I went to high school in Florida as well. Oh. I went to Pinellas County Center for the Arts, and I studied acting. Wow. That's uh, five miles from my home. Really? Where I grew up, yeah. So I graduated in 2000. 2002. <laughs> and... This musical employed a bunch of kids from my school, probably didn't pay them, and then, <laughs> you know, some imported out of town actors. And there was this one velvet voiced mixed actor that I met at a party. I'm surprised he even came to a, a high school kid's party, but, he, you know, I think he was in town without a lot to do, mm. you know, but but rehearsed for this musical. And I became totally enamored with him, and he took me out, and and he was the first person I ever gave a blowjob to. <laughs> and I remember thinking, hmm... That doesn't look like the rest of his skin. <laughs> that looks kind of purple. <laughs> and, but I still thought it was, I, it was. I wasn't repulsed by it. I thought it was kind of interesting. And and I maybe read some articles, but I hadn't. I really don't think I'd seen any porn at this point. I, I didn't have much of a frame of reference for what I was doing. I understood that I was giving a blowjob, but I. I didn't really know any technique or anything. And and I remember him saying, are you sure you haven't done this before? And I was like, ooh, I'm good <laughs> at it. Ooh, exciting. And, and then he came in my mouth and told me that it would feel different to him if I didn't swallow. Hmm. And later I've wondered if that was emotional manipulation or if it was if he was saying that he would feel emotionally different if I swallowed. He would feel good knowing that I wanted to take him into my body or something. Or if he was just kind of being a manipulative jerk? When he said feel, was he referring to sensation or emotions? I don't know. Because it would have a different sensation if you held it in your mouth. Kind of a lubricating feeling. Mm -hmm. That could have been what he was referring to. But the fact that I didn't seemed to want to but he convinced me mm. you know by saying that it would feel different to him and I wanted it to feel good to him of course I mm -hmm. wanted to please him I wanted to be good and I remember I don't know if it was that day or another day but I remember being in his little little rented actor apartment or provided actor apartment and him saying, you know, you don't have to perform for me. And I was so struck by it because what I heard when he said, you know, you don't have to perform for me is don't be fake. I think what he actually meant was 
I really like you and you can relax. That's not what I heard in that moment. And then I felt super self-conscious so that whenever I was exuberant, gregarious, excited, I thought, am I performing for him? Hmm. Have you ever been kind of poked about that or called out? Yeah. I remember one partner in particular would kind of make fun of me for trying to be cool. And my response to it was actually one of of hurt and insecurity and earnest saying, I'm not trying. But what she heard was, I don't have to try to be cool. I just am. Oh, no. And that's really not what I was saying. And we had that conversation multiple times. And I just kept trying to insist I'm not doing anything. I'm just being myself. And there were these moments that were also me being myself where I was sillier or childish or just really mm, playful. Mm -hmm. And that's what she wanted from me almost all the time. But those moments just come out when they come out. I'm not holding them back and I'm not faking them when they come out. So it really struck me as a weird thing. But when I perform or entertain or attempt to be fascinating or to capture someone's attention, there's so many different ways to do it and they're all very real for me. They're different emphasis on different sides of who I am. Yeah, I think what he seemed to be pointing to was that somehow what I was doing was a less authentic expression in his eyes. And he wanted something different from me. But the desire to please charm and entertain him was very authentic to me. Mm. <laughs> Maybe he also was trying to reduce pressure. Mm. Maybe he was trying to put you at ease. Yeah. Insisting you were good enough already. And you didn't need to try hard. Mm, that does sound like him. And then I imagine he was quite aware of the fact that he was doing what I dreamed of doing. So he was already kind of in this aspirational position. And he might have been saying with that, mm. I think you're lovely. I think you're great. Maybe saying... I'm already impressed. Right. Otherwise, I wouldn't be spending time with you. Yeah. Hmm. Still in contact with him, I could ask him. Wow. Might as well. <laughs> I ran into him at an airport with his, with his wife some years ago. My year of travel. Somewhere... I don't even remember. All airports look kind of the same. I grew up in airports, so I disagree. I know them. I know some inside and out. My father worked for the airlines, and our family flew for free. So it was literally cheaper to fly than to drive. Spent countless nights in the Charlotte airport, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia. <laughs> Because if there was no room on the plane, we had to just wait till the next one or the next day. 
So I got really good at sleeping on the floor. Wow, yeah. But the Charlotte airport has a grand piano, or at least it did for 20-some years, in the middle of one of the lobbies in between the terminals. And I started piano lessons when I was four years old. I was pretty serious about it for 10 years and took a break in high school and picked it up again in college. So whenever I was in Charlotte, I would play for everyone. Sometimes for hours. Just waiting for the next plane. Did you ever want to be a pilot? No. My father's occupation didn't really register on my radar at all. He was a flight attendant and worked for the Union, which is not quite as glamorous as pilot. But the pilots just annoyed me because they had seniority and could bump us off a flight. Right. Damn pilots. Mm. Trying to get home. Now I have to sleep on the floor because of you. <laughs> Was it just you and your parents and your family? Yeah, me and my parents and my siblings, two sisters and a brother. Oh, well, that's a lot more than just you and your parents. Yeah. Two sisters and a brother. And yeah. where do you fall? I'm the youngest. That is not what I expected you to say. Yeah, I'm, I have a weird experience as a child where I'm the youngest by quite a few years with the oldest 11 years older than me. So there was a point where I was an only child because they'd all moved away. Mm -hmm. And we're half siblings that come from previous marriages. So sometimes I was one of two, one of three, one of four, one of one. So there was a a flux in your household. Right. Do you want children yourself? Never. I don't either. I'm going to get snipped soon. I've been thinking about it for almost a decade. Why now as opposed to earlier? When I first looked into it, no doctor would snip me. Not in America, anyway. Too young at 24. You, and they thought you were going to change your mind. They didn't want to be responsible for that. Right. They felt it was unethical. On a do-no-harm level. Hmm. And I got more serious about it when I turned 30. Then at the time, I was stepping up more as an educator and a, for lack of a better term, talk show host for various other right. educators with my poly talks. And so I changed goals. And even though there are other methods of male birth control that are either currently on the market or will be in years to come, I see it as more of a socio-political move, and thus I want more visibility of it. So I'm trying to find the right doctor who will allow me to put it on video for the whole process to be on video, including the consultations and the conversations where they try to convince me not to do it and possibly talk me out of it and all the way through the actual surgery which is minimal it's a it's a very simple surgery usually in office and you go home you don't have to do a hospital stay but finding that doctor has proven very difficult mm, i can imagine and usually it's on the budget of some type of documentarian or reality tv and they can afford the filming rights in L.A. If it was in another city, it'd probably be cheap. You could travel to do it. I've thought about it. Yeah, It's a growing priority. I want to get this over with. I like that you want to demystify it. I also think it's important for people to see the corresponding 
doctor trying to talk you out of what you've decided you want to do with your body from a penis owner's perspective. Right. Yeah. The opposite. I don't want to have a child. No, I'm telling you, I really know that I don't want to have any children. How do I convince you that I know what I want to do and not want to do with my body? It's so wild, the perception of it, especially because sperm production continues. So if there's ever a powerful desire to undo it, it can be undone. You can re-stitch the tubes for about $10,000, or you can just go in locally and extract the sperm. It's not that big of a deal, but the medical profession treats it as a big, big deal. Apparently the reversals don't all work from what I understand. From That's true. That's true, but... I think in the next few years, we're going to have trans folks able to carry a baby to term. And there's all kinds of science at this point that can find a way. When you're talking about reversals of vasectomies, we're talking about microsurgery to stitch together very tiny tubes so that you can still impregnate the natural way. It's trying to go back to the way before it was cut. But what we're not talking about is complete destruction of the reproductive organs themselves. You're still producing sperm. Mm -hmm. Easy to extract. Maybe what it needs is a sexier name. Vasectomy really just doesn't sound very, you know? Neither does tubal ligation. Well, it's true. I don't think that's a good one either. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know... I don't know. Male birth control sounds really good to me. Yeah. The but meth- except we can't we can't really if we're with gender, that's not so great, right? Sperm so. birth control, perhaps. Mm. Sperm control. Mm. Sperm control. We've got it. We've got it. Sold millions <laughs> across across America tomorrow. There's some <laughs> sperm control method of sperm control. I believe originated in India and tested there over 10 years ago that's just now spreading worldwide. I heard about it at the Cycles and Sex Conference. Yeah, you just plug the, the tubes. And then you unplug the tubes if you ever want to reverse it. Because mm-hmm. they had the clips was seen as a, a temporary method, but those spermies are wily guys that get through there. <laughs> There's even even stories of of snipped tubes reconnecting themselves. What? And so they started doing uh, cauterizing of the tubes to prevent that. Whoa. Life uh, finds a way. Right. <laughs> what are you quoting? Jurassic Park, Jeff Goldblum. Ah, yes. He's on the big comeback lately. Well, I was... In fact, just talking about him yesterday because my host that I'm staying with doesn't get gooey about any celebrities but gets totally gooey about Jeff Goldblum (laughs) and went to his jazz show and, you know, was like, what do I say? How? What do I offer Jeff Goldblum? And so when it was her turn, you know, to speak to, to Jeff, she said, Thank you for being you. <laughs> and he said, oh, honey, thank you for being you. And he pulled <laughs> her into this big hug. And she has this ear to ear grin that I've never seen on her face, that none of her friends have ever seen on her face. That <laughs> is just astonishingly Cheshire Cat like. No, it's not Cheshire Cat like. It's just astonishingly beaming. <laughs> and... <laughs> And then today she she texted me a picture of him wearing an adorable rainbow sweater with a cat on it. And she was just just on the floor with the the delight of this photograph of Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> how do we start talking about Jeff Goldblum again? <laughs> We're talking about how sperm is oh, yes, so determined. Finds a way. What is up with that? Why are there not more 
male methods of birth control? Is it really just that it's easier to put the responsibility on the person who can bear the baby? I think that some of it is medical in previous decades where attempts at a male pill were a total failure resulting in deformed sperm that might have resulted in being infertile afterward. I also heard at, at Cycles and Sex that it made the libido drop and and they were not up for that. Right, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're hearing a lot of that nowadays even with the, the new male pill and the studies on it you know, in recent years where men just weren't willing to put up with the side effects. But decreased libido is a common side effect of of the pill. Right. Regardless of gender. I definitely prefer when my partners are not on the pill. I've been using condoms with all my partners for years. All of them? Yeah. So there was another one that I planned to listen to today where you were talking about barrierless Fluid sex. bonding. Yeah. What do you think of that term? In that podcast of 45 minutes, a big point I make is that kissing is inherently fluid bonded. You're exchanging a lot Saliva. of fluids. And there's a lot of potential there. You know, I have HSV1 herpes. There's... As what? 70 90 percent something Ugh. absurd of <laughs> something people like in the that. world have i think in la the numbers are 20 percent of us have symptoms including me so that's absolutely fluid bonded in my book but we've come to equate it in a very heteronormative definition that it's specifically about a condom on a penis or none and that's Fluid bonded or not fluid bonded. Well, that's not necessarily heteronormative since it could have to do with gay male sex as well. It, sure. I suppose just penis centric then. Mm hmm. And I really think of fluid bonding as not only a spectrum, but multiple intersecting spectrums. In the kink world, you might be fluid bonded with a particular knife. And that knife is getting exposed to bloodborne pathogens if there are any. That's a whole other type of, of fluid bonding. Mm. So it's what fluid is being bonded, what body parts are, are involved here, whether it be saliva or other mucous membranes. Mm -hmm. And the relative risks of what's happening. You know, saliva does kill a lot of different things. It's it's meant to digest. There's a lot of natural, already built-in immuno systems that protect us from a lot of things. We're exposed to all kinds of things. If I suck on my finger right now, there's a lot of potential disease just from that. Just by not washing my hands for the last couple hours. But, you know, it, it's all about being risk-aware in my book, not necessarily risk-free. Well, that's not possible. <laughs> yeah, do nothing. <laughs> interact with Go no nowhere. One. Live don't, in a bubble. Don't breathe. Don't eat. <laughs> There's a movie about that. Is there? Yeah. It's a little romance, indie romance. Girl can't go outside because she can't interact with the environment. But she falls in love with the next door. I haven't actually seen it. But I, <laughs> I saw the. I saw, the, saw the trailer. I saw the trailer, <laughs> and I I actually wanted to see it. They got me. <laughs> Seems like one of those you know the Notebook kind of things. Yeah. Just setting yourself up for for a good weep. 
<laughs> which I'm down for, very much down for. I've been considering going on prep for the last few years, and I can't pinpoint exactly why I'm still just considering it and not doing it. For one, when I tried three years ago, I was rejected. They would not give me access because I was considered low risk, even though I had multiple partners. But since we were all using condoms and there was no serodiscordant issue with HIV, I was low risk. So they what felt that... Is serodiscordant? When one person has HIV and the other partner does not. Mm, okay. So positive and negative. Where you were knowingly taking that risk on a regular basis. Um, and at the time, there were supply and demand issues. And so it was considered that with my behaviors and demographic and risk that I was taking, which was low, I was actually taking it out of the mouths of people who really need it. Right. And that was good enough for me. You mm -hmm. know, case settled. But those issues are largely resolved, and there is a lot more supply now. And so my main reason for not taking it is cost, which it's pretty cheap, but still another cost in life. And some hesitancy regarding the potential side effects, which I'm always looking into it and learned new stuff this week that a lot of the side effects are easily reversible. You stop taking it, they go away. So I don't know a lot about prep, but you would take it if you had HIV or if you're trying to prevent? It's primarily for someone who does not have HIV. So you're negative and you are being exposed to it. Or if you are engaging in behaviors that are considered a higher risk mm. of exposure. And you would take it because you occasionally have multiple casual partners? It's hard to say. I mean, my behaviors are pretty low risk because I'm always using condoms. And they're low risk behaviors in general. The non-monogamy is the risk in itself. And also there is a bit of cognitive dissonance in that I get tested a couple times a year for the whole gamut of STIs, including HIV. So if I'm getting tested, why don't I just take the preventative when only three people have ever gotten HIV while on PrEP? It's that wow. effective. The third one was in February 2017. It's just incredibly effective wow that's that is astonishing to me i didn't know that and so while you could still contract anything else and so there's still some you know some risk involved with any behavior that risk is basically eliminated but that's the one that's most likely to be fatal it's one of them hep c is a big deal too there's a variety of big deals out there most of them are very small deal. You know, I I got chlamydia once, anal chlamydia. It was such a ridiculously small deal. I didn't even know I had it. There was no risk of spreading it. I took one pill and it was gone in four days. When you said you got tested for the gamut, so it wasn't just gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia, HIV. You also got tested for... Hep C, and the oral and anal swabs, which a lot of people don't get. Mm. And you have to ask for those specifically. Otherwise, they won't test on a standard test. Do they give you pushback? Do they question you as to why you want it? They tend to ask if you've had exposure. And I literally got my first anal swab as a bit of a larf. Like, eh. Why not? And uh, it turns out I had chlamydia. And we really had to scratch our heads and figure out what could be the possible source. What we determined is I'd probably had it for four or five years. 
And that particular exposure was someone who had told me back then that they had it. And I had never had the anal swab. So I was like, well, my penis doesn't have chlamydia. My mouth, throat doesn't. I must be fine. And we determined that it was probably from her being a squirter, being on top and dripping into me. Wow. Which there's literally zero way to protect yourself from that. Do you know about those almost like Batman underwear, <laughs> you know? What? Like, like it's not... It has nothing to do with Batman, but I was just trying to describe, like the the full latex short. Oh, have you any experience with that? <laughs> I was just so distracted because one of my partners has Batman underwear panties that she wears all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like yes, the Batman panties. <laughs> um, I've heard of this a year or two ago. There was a couple that came to me. And I do what I call non-monogamy consulting and clients come to me with questions and advice and, you know, therapists can do certain things and they're not going to give you advice in the same way. So I'm not a therapist by any means, but they came to me asking about those. And the reason was, is because one of them had a new partner, an additional partner that had herpes hsv2 genitally that's the reason i'm asking about it because there's somebody that i would really like to <laughs> to play with a little bit further but it seems like there would really be not a lot of pleasure or sensation if they were totally the whole groin and cock and everything were covered <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of fun stuff you could do, especially on a kink level, whether it be vibrators. Oh, or, absolutely. You know, there's all this stuff. But on some level, if there's no outbreak, the risk is low. It's not zero, but it's really low. Yeah, they've had no outbreak since their first yeah, and only one. The initial, yeah. And they take something some sort of medication regularly yeah suppressant or doctors recommend for me to just take a certain milligram of lysine and folic acid and they actually don't want me to take viral suppressant because of i don't know why that's what multiple doctors have told me hmm. because my outbreaks are so minimal and rare that it's not worth it. The supplements are enough. But anyway, yeah, at some point you just say, you know what? Is there really that much difference between HSV1 and HSV2? Is there that much difference between oral herpes and genital herpes? Both are a type of outbreak. Both are a certain type of stigma, which is unwarranted. And, and you can have one or two in either place. Correct. Which I didn't realize until recently. Or both. Mm -hmm. You can have herpes anywhere on your body, including in your cuticles, which is usually called Whitlow. Hmm. You can get it in your eyeball. You can get it anywhere. But, you know, there'll, there'll probably never be a cure or even a vaccine because it's not that big of a deal. <sighs> Dear listeners, I send what I call missives to my email list once a week. It's sort of like lobbing several thousand messages in a bottle out to sea. I share my writing. I share resources from the episodes. I share some saucy photos and other miscellanea like the time I was in Playboy. To receive all this goodness directly in your inbox, sign up on HorizontalWithLila.com and add Lila at HorizontalWithLila.com to your address book, because apparently it's been getting lost in some sort of updates tab, and that is wrong. Season 2 has been edited by Chad Michael Snavely, podcast impresario. Check out ChadMichael.com. 
Shauna Shea drew my central cover art, and you can hire her through 99designs. And Alan Markley created my intro music. He's Plastic Cannons on Instagram. Next week, Rye and I get deep into kink, dominance, BDSM, and a fairly wild fet life story. Until then, may you have someone to love, something to do, and lots of things to look forward to. It's been a pleasure getting horizontal for you. Dixie. You know Dixie? De La Tour. Yes. Dixie recorded with her in San Francisco. And she talked to Reed and she's like, what should, you know, what should I know? What are the what are the best practices? And he said, Don't eat beans. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do, don't be the little spoon. <laughs> <laughs>